Prayers in the Night, Chapter 5, Those Who Work, Restoration. We are dust, and to dust we shall return, but first we work. We leave our small mark on the world. For the most part, it will soon be erased, as surely as my daughter's chalk drawings on the sidewalk will vanish with one hard rain. But our work matters just as those chalked butterflies and rainbows matter to me and to my daughters. Our work, whether paid or not, drudgery or a joy, skilled or common, makes a difference. Done well, it adds truth, beauty, and goodness to the world. It pushes back the darkness. Most of the prayers of Compline emerged before electricity and 24-hour connectivity. When the world was lit by firelight, the majority of nighttime work was the work of crises, emergencies, grave illnesses, defense against intruders or armies, but that wasn't all the work done at night. From time to time, the poor and working class would rise midway through the night to relight fires or attend to other household tasks. The learned would study by flickering candlelight. Midwives guided new life into the world. Mothers woke to nurse or quiet their children, and monks would wake for their work of prayer. Our work weaves us together as a human race, dependent and interconnected. All of us rely on the work of others. We count on those who are often nameless and invisible to us. One Anglican night prayer reads, Watch over those both night and day who work while others sleep, and grant that we may never forget that our common life depends upon each other's toil through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our life together depends on one another's toil. We need each other. We need others to do their work well. One gift of vulnerability is that we are not sufficient alone. We wouldn't have made it past day one by ourselves. We are made to rely on others, and our ever-present neediness ensures that we must whether we want to or not. None of us will ever be purely self-reliant, bootstraps be damned. Even before the first minor chord sounded in humanity's song, when things were as they should be, and we knew no suffering or pain, we still were not self-sufficient. It was not good for man to be alone. In our purest humanity, we were interdependent and needy. We relied on God and on other people. And we worked. We worked together even. Our common life depended on each other's toil. There are many paintings of Adam and Eve in the garden, blissful and naked, but very few portray them working in any way. It's as if we can't imagine work without drudgery as if paradise necessarily excludes office meetings and household chores. Admittedly, Adam and Eve could skip out on laundry. But even in perfection, Adam and Eve worked. We are made to share a common life of work and creativity, and once all things are redeemed, we will not suddenly become supermen and superwomen who are autonomous and self-sustaining. We will never not be needy. We will never not need God and one another. Our telos is community, not self-sufficiency. It's a feast, a life together. Even now we work towards this vision of redemption. We weep and watch, but we don't stop there. We don't take a passive posture towards the renewal of the world. Our shared human vulnerability calls us to action, to work. Our response to human vulnerability is always, in part, to seek to mitigate it, to make the world, however slightly, more peaceful, safe, beautiful, just, and truthful. Through our vocations, we seek to love others in embodied and practical ways. We do this through our jobs. The call to alleviate suffering births many of our vocations, from parenting to fighting fires to teaching yoga from politics to medicine to social work. And we do this as a church. For two millennia, Christians have formed hospitals, orphanages, homes for the disabled and poor, schools and universities. Beyond this, 
We care for those who are hurting in our daily life. We take care of one another in thousands of quiet, unsung ways. In 2017, church members showed up at my house bearing meals, art supplies for our kids, and once a big bottle of scotch. They helped shoulder our burden. But good work in the darkness, in the face of our vulnerability and weakness, is not only done out of our desire to alleviate suffering, it also arises from our desire to defy it, to make beauty from ashes. The week I found out my second son had died in utero, my close friend Katie was going to visit me from Nashville to bring comfort and good conversation amidst loss. But she had to cancel because she found out that same week that she had an aggressive form of cancer. I cried as I told my husband the news. He cried as he asked our daughters to pray for Katie. After her diagnosis, Katie immediately entered into months of chemotherapy, and as life-saving poison pumped into her body, she wrote poems. Katie is a poet, and the threat of death was not going to stop her from making beauty come hell or high water, or chemo. Her work was a way to form something luminous and enduring out of pain. In this way, she would not let darkness have the last word. We work to bring justice to the world, to bring help in crisis, but we also work for beauty, laughter, and levity, for sheer pleasure. We paint, quilt, cook, act, and perform stand-up. All these kinds of work participate in God's mending of a world unraveled. All these kinds of work participate in God's mending of a world unraveled. As we pray for those who work, we hold two realities in tension. Our own labor participates in God's work of bringing light into darkness, but all human work continues in the meantime in the midst of very real darkness. We pray for those who work, and we know that work itself is often a place of futility, where we bump up against the wrecked state of the world. We experience what the scriptures call toil, Ecclesiastes 2, 17-26. We sow and seemingly do not reap. We fail. The scriptures constantly distinguish between the good work for which we are made and the presence of toil in our lives, the literal and metaphorical thorns and thistles thistles that make work itself a place of pain. The Bible is full of lament over toil, specifically, and nowhere more than Ecclesiastes. The writer of Ecclesiastes says he hated life because of toil, which is all vanity and a chasing after the wind. These verses won't make a good motivational poster for the wall of our cubicle, but the scriptures do not mince words about the fact that our work is often disappointing, grueling, unrewarding, meaningless, and even exploitative and degrading. A friend of mine, whose husband has a seemingly great job in tech, tells me that he often can't sleep at night because he's worried about his work. In his field, Amidst the dazzle of geniuses, startups, and youthful energy, people are expendable resources. A good quarter means new hires. A bad quarter means layoffs. Most of us work in industries where, in one way or another, our health, presence, home life, limits, and humanity are not valued. Many of us lie awake anxiously, worried about our jobs. Still more are up late fretfully putting in a few more hours, trying to safeguard ourselves against our own dispensability. But though each of us experiences toil, frustration, and futility in our work, clearly some have it harder than others, and these often work while the rest of us sleep. Though all sectors of society are increasingly working at night, the youngest, poorest, and least educated are far more likely to work through the dark hours. Immigrants in particular account for a disproportionate number of night shift workers. The Washington Post explains that to be an immigrant in the United States frequently means not only doing the jobs many Americans shun, but also working the hours many Americans won't. When we pray for those who work at night, we are often praying for the poor, 
the marginalized, and the most vulnerable in our society. And the eschatological reality we watch for, work itself will be made new. Isaiah 65 speaks of God creating a new heaven and a new earth where labor will no longer be marked by toil. It's not that we will no longer work. We won't spend eternity sitting around eating Cheetos and binging Netflix. Instead, God's people shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Isaiah 65:22. None of us will labor in vain. In Signs Amid the Rubble, Leslie New writes that it is not only bodies that will one day be raised, but our work as well. All the faithful labor of God's servants, which time seems to have buried in the dust of failure, will be raised up, will be found to be there, transfigured in the new kingdom. Their labor was not lost. It has found its place in the completed kingdom. Our work was always meant to be a source of blessedness, abundance, and joy that ripples through all eternity. As we weep over the brokenness and futility of work and watch for God to restore all things, we also work with whatever limited gifts, influence, and capacity God has given us for the renewal of work itself and of systems of labor and commerce in our world. Prayer itself is a kind of work and it sends us into our work in the world. For the Christian, the postures of prayer and work are interwoven. Ora et labora, pray and work. We work as prayer and pray as work. And our prayer and our work transform each other. Yet we can falsely pit prayer and work against each other as if one makes the other unnecessary. These days we tend to understand accomplishments as either our work of God our work or God's, but never both. We've come to subtly believe that our agency is therefore in competition with God's agency. We believe the lie that goodness, truth, beauty, healing, and justice are hewn solely through our own effort or that they are God's to grant without any action on our part. God therefore is useful as a miracle worker or as a Hail Mary pass. He's a wizard we ask to zap the world with signs and wonders when we aren't up for the job. In this way of thinking, though we may sometimes call on God to act when we're feeling desperate, we are mostly on our own. In the warp and woof of life, which is a reference to uh, the warp and woof on a loom making cloth, In the laundry and lawmaking, the finance and forestry, the medicine and mothering, the ditch digging and diplomacy, God is largely absent. This kind of competitive agency is illustrated in a bit by Scottish comedian Daniel Sloss, whose comedy I enjoy despite his metaphysics. Sloss talks about how disappointing it is for parents to spend time, effort, and money on Christmas gifts only for Santa to get all the credit. Then he says that's exactly how doctors feel whenever you thank God. He mimics a cancer patient who goes into remission. Oh, thank the Lord, the doctor replies. You know, it's funny. I couldn't see his name on your chart. Could see my name right at the top there, Dr. Michaels. The patient argues the Lord sent you. The doctor replies to the crowd's uproarious laughter. He certainly didn't chip in for that medical degree. God gave the cancer. The doctor cured it. If we accept the lens of competitive agency, God gets all the blame and none of the credit. He is responsible for cancer, tsunamis, car accidents, while we deserve all the thanks for the cure, the recovery effort, and the safety engineering. This way of understanding the world would have been unimaginable for most of human history. God's work was neither understood as separate from nor in competition with our own. It was the very life from which all fruitful work flows. God did not exist to fill in the gaps of what we cannot achieve through our own work. The Christian understanding of agency is that all good work is a participation in the very life of God. It is our act of cooperation with the sustainer of the universe. It flows from prayer and back into prayer. The assumption of competitive agency affects all of us. 
even Christians, so that we can sometimes come to see prayer as a passive act. We're waiting for a breakthrough, for God to miraculously fix us. God may be a miracle worker, but he's a distant one, showing up rarely and leaving the daily maintenance of the world to us. Or we reduce prayer to a personal moment of comfort or piety. God is our pious pick-me-up, a break from the big bad world of work, politics, and need. So prayer then is either an escape or a way to magically fill in that small space where our own work fails. But if God is behind, under, and throughout all good work and every moment of our lives, prayer is never a merely spiritual act of piety a few feet off the ground, divorced from the real work of the world. When we pray for healing or redemption or peace or justice, we're praying for those who work, for scientists, for doctors, poets, potters, researchers, retail clerks, farmers, politicians, and pilots, these actual and limited men and women through whom God is bringing renewal. Praying this way changes how we work. We can take up our daily work knowing that through it, we participate in the eternal work of God. We can take up our vocations not simply to find success, get a paycheck, or make a name for ourselves, but from a place of rest in God. This view of work also changes prayer. The practice of prayer becomes a propulsive force, galvanizing our participation with God's work. Harvard professor Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress, outlines how our lives have been improved by reason, particularly science and technology. Pinker explicitly pits prayer against this work of progress. He writes... Ever creative Homo sapiens had long fought back against disease with quackery such as prayer, but starting in the late 18th century with the invention of vaccination and accelerating in the 19th century with the acceptance of germ theory of disease, the tide of battle began to turn. Hand washing, midwifery, mosquito control, and especially the protection of drinking water by public sewerage and chlorinated tap water would come to save billions of lives. Pinker presumes that prayer and God himself dwells in some other dimension than hand-washing germ theory or sewers. Believer and unbeliever alike can slip into this way of thinking. We wall off prayer, whether we think it's quackery or not, from hard human work, acts of genius, leaps in technology, or bills becoming laws. One evening, I came downstairs and to my surprise found Jonathan crying while reading, positively weeping over the kindness and generosity of God. But he wasn't reading the Bible or the church fathers. He was reading Pinker, Pinker's Enlightenment Now. I began to laugh as my husband read about the billions of lives that have been saved through clean water and modern medical care. He saw the work of God in and through people's work. Steven Pinker and Jonathan were looking at the same data, but their stories about reality made them narrate that data in completely different ways. Where Pinker saw quackery, Jonathan saw glory. He was filled with wonder that God would usher such astounding healing into this sad world and give men and women the privilege of participating in that work. The Christian story dares us to believe that the work of prayer is not so far away from the gift of sewers, that hands lifted in prayer and the scientific commendation of hand washing flow from a shared source. Our work of prayer participates in and propels our public work of restoration. I was a campus minister with graduate students and faculty for about a decade. I watched Christians who work in public health, research, literature, and the arts hold their work and worship together. Their very lives challenge any idea of competitive agency. One of my former students, a physicist, told me that she sees no conflict between her scientific research and the work of prayer, between what she named as natural, observable cause and divine action. It brings joy, she says, 
that an unfathomable God chooses to do things in fathomable ways, ways we can learn about, grasp, and take part in. One perk of serving as a priest in a parish near teaching hospitals and universities is that I regularly get a front row seat to watch some of the world's smartest people embrace prayer and redemptive work together. One friend and parishioner, Noel, has trained and studied for decades to be among a do few dozen doctors in the United States who can do the kind of pediatric surgery he does. Sometimes his surgeries take over 10 hours. They are complex, intense, and exhausting. And on those days, you can find Noel standing in a hospital break room, praying. Clipped to the door inside his surgical locker is a liturgy he prays before and during surgery. At the encouragement of his spiritual director, Noel wrote it himself, drawing from the Book of Common Prayer in Scripture. He prays, Grant me, O Lord, for your sake, through the work of your Holy Spirit, love for my patient, joy in participating in this work, peace as I follow your lead, patience in the trying times of this case, kindness to all in the room, goodness in this difficult task, faithfulness to have integrity in the details even when no one else but you sees, and self-control that my own sins of anger, anxiety, and vain glory would not mar my judgment. He prays for his patient by name, then he scrubs back in and continues surgery. His patients rave about him. One father says simply, he saved my daughter's life, but Noel tells me his job is simply a chance to be a minister of common grace. So as the sun sets at the end of a long day, he completes his work. A child has been helped and healed, and a man takes off his surgical mask and exhales a prayer of thanks that he could participate in God's restoration, that his work can be part of God's own work. My friend works as one who prays and prays as one who works. Taken together, working and watching and weeping are a way to endure the mystery of theodicy. They are a faithful response to our shared human tragedy, but only when we hold all three together, giving space and energy to each, both as individuals and as a church. If in the face of loss or failure, we launch immediately into work, into solutions, activity, programs, plans, without leaving space for grief or attentiveness to God, our work will be compulsive, frenzied, and vain. This is why, by the way, I reversed the prayer's order and began with weeping, except in emergencies, there's usually wisdom in not going straight to work. If we watch for God's restoration without also mourning and laboring, we minimize the urgent needs of the world and become sentimental, apathetic, or passive. If we weep without watching for the coming kingdom and participating in God's work, we fall into despair. To take up the practices of weeping and watching compels us to work. And our work is shaped and sanctified by people who, through embodied and habitual practices, have learned to weep and to watch. God entered this world of toil and did good work. Jesus wept, watched, and worked. He held all three together. He healed people and cast out demons. He alleviated suffering in this world. Not permanently. People still get sick. People still got sick, even while he walked on earth. Francis Spufford points out that for all the healing Jesus accomplished, he barely moved the needle on the number of lepers in the ancient Near East, or the number of women hemorrhaging, or the number of people who died. But through his work, Jesus showed us what the kingdom of God looks like. In the kingdom, people are healed, forgiven, restored, and made whole. Jesus also spent time, decades even, building stuff. Jesus was a tradesman. He's called a tecton, a builder who used his hands. God came to earth and apparently thought it worth his while to take some wood or stone or metal and make something. 
What did he make? We have no idea. Apparently nothing earth-shattering enough to have been kept around. But in this dark world where men and women were dying, where the poor were suffering, where injustice raged in a vast and violent empire, God became flesh and built some furniture. During all those decades that he spent building things, he wasn't preaching, healing, or clearing out temples. He wasn't starting a movement or raising the dead. The light came into the darkness and did ordinary work. All of Jesus' work brought redemption, not just the work that awed the crowds, the feeding of the multitude, the Sermon on the Mount, the raising of Jairus' daughter, but also his quiet craft. The Gospels show us Jesus' rhythm of engaging in work and public ministry, and then, as Luke says, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. His work of prayer sent him out to his active life of work, which in turn sent him back into the work of prayer. Jesus' work ultimately led him to the cross where weeping, watching, and working meet. On the cross, Jesus wept in darkness as he watched for a new world to be born, which he birthed through his own labor. Even now, after his resurrection and ascension, God mysteriously continues weeping, watching, and working. The work of Jesus here on earth and his work now in heaven, which is not a far off place, but nearer to us than our own bodies, is not completely dissimilar. His work in the incarnation and after his ascension are different, but they are not discordant. In his life on earth, we glimpse the continuing work of God even now. At this very moment, Christ does the work of prayer, interceding for us. He does not weep as we weep, but as our friend and redeemer, he enters into our weeping. He watches with us, not as we watch, but in holy and perfect attentiveness, watching with utter and loving absorption as each sparrow falls, as each sea lily creeps across the ocean floor, as each mitochondrion gathers nutrients in our cells. And he works to restore in galaxies and empires, in our streets, homes, and offices, and in our beds at night, he works to make every last thing new.